Hey guys, that's me. My name is Jason. I'm a junior at the Colorado School of Mines studying computer science. Not that I spend much of my time at all at my home college, or that I always enjoy computer science. I'm a junior studying computer science because I feel like computer science taps into the human spark to engineer reality to solve problems in a way that we haven't had access to before as a species. We can use our intelligence and creativity to bake those very characteristics into what we make. We tricked rocks and electricity into following our commands, slaves to our imagination, rocks that can now think on their own, solve problems that even our brains cannot do individually, rocks that can perform computational magic, rocks that can create, rocks that are all around us, assisting us, made of the single most abundant element on the surface of the earth. It's like we're meant to advance as a species, like we're meant to learn the language to control these rocks. It's a miracle, but it's a miracle we're blind to because we live the miracle every day, every hour. That's why I study computer science. It's combining human creativity and technology to create almost whatever we can hope to understand, turning our imaginations directly into reality. I believe that we're at a pivotal point in technological advancement, where our technology design choices matter more than ever. We've seen technology totally transform and replace entire industries. Somehow, the collective intelligence of humanity has been able to engineer inventions that can dictate life or death, determine entire futures, and even play an integral role in almost every instant of our day-to-day -day life. Whether it's humans getting richer, smarter, or even healthier, since the Industrial Revolution, it seems like we've been able to leverage our intelligence to engineer the marvelous technological world we live in today. We have largely conquered the three biggest human pitfalls, famine, war, and plague. We spend so much energy on pessimism, despite that almost every benchmark of progress is shooting up sharply. Of course, it's no time to stop innovating as profound environmental and societal problems loom in the horizon. But the point is, as of this recording on a macro scale, there has never been a better time to be human. So why, for many of us, does it not feel like this? Why can we enjoy the technological miracles teeming in every corner of everyday life, in the best time to be alive, yet still be sinking into a collective depression. The world's getting better by almost every statistic, but our happiness is not following the trend. Being richer, that makes us happy to a point. Being healthier, also happy to a point. But at this certain point, the wonderful world we live in now is just not enough. The number of people with mental illnesses is skyrocketing from hundreds of millions to many millions more. 20% of old people reported. Most of these people don't get treatment, Suicide kills twice as much as homicide. We all know somebody personally who's deeply struggling just to function in the presence of these mental days. The mental health numbers are daunting, but it's of course well beyond numbers. The profound sorrow of the struggle to live is just tragic. Some are quick to blame the very technologies that have propelled us into the future we live in now. Many technologies are designed not for long-term consumer happiness, but for company profit. But blaming technology broadly, or being overly pessimistic about the struggles of the world, seems to be far more reactive than productive. I don't think it's time to pump the brakes on technology. It's time to embrace technology with open arms. There's no reason that daunting problems like mental health can't be significantly reduced with the right technology. And that's my motivation going into this documentary. I want to explore spiritual technology. For these purposes, it's the use of technology to enhance practices which allow one to understand oneself better in the context of a universe beyond one's complete understanding. I feel like this process of spiritual self-discovery is absolutely fundamental to many of these mental health problems plaguing the globe today. Specifically, I want to explore how we can make spiritual technology that still retains authenticity, whatever that might mean. I'm going to go to Nepal for a month live in a monastery, interview everyone I can, and use some of the most promising Western technologies of today in conjunction with the Eastern wisdom of the past. Maybe a direct link with ancient practices combined with modern tech could create the ideal environment for understanding spiritual technology. I hope to have a taste of this field before it inevitably becomes a part of the lives of many. To explore technology with the explicit intention to fill the holes that modern solutions just can't fill. To fill holes of profound human suffering that continue to get deeper and deeper year by year. To me, why technology seemed pretty intuitive, but why Buddhism? Spiritual experiences are not confined to any region or religion. Well, first some background on me. 
I was brought up Christian as a child, always dutifully going to summer camps, church, and Sunday school every week. This had its many ups and downs. I saw many people exhibit great love and strength through their faith in God, many gaining so much reassurance and spiritual healing through the teachings of this faith. Some even used their belief to navigate topics as heavy as death itself. My grandma is now 92 and is still a fervent believer. Posters of Jesus are plastered all around her house. Many of my closest friends are believers and have always been willing to teach me more about their religion from a place of love. They would say, to love somebody is to open their heart up to God. And I could feel the good intentions in the many who tried to answer my questions and my spiritual seeking. There were parts that struck me the wrong way, however. Growing up in one of the most conservative cities in the US definitely had a good bit of anti-science and homophobia mixed in with the whole religion package. Although lots of that I could ignore, the real breakaway was when I felt like I was forced to do it against my will as a part of the family. Believing something so completely without scientific evidence felt unreasonable, and conforming to this force felt like giving in to the wants of a bully. So I became agnostic, and I was adamant, convincing others and even converting others to a similar philosophy. The firm ground I thought my spiritual stance was on started to crumble come late high school. Years later, I got diagnosed with OCD. I remember the doctor coming in after all the tests. He told me, based on the tests, I should get medicated if I had a score over 20. I asked him my score. He looked at me sternly. You have a 53. For a long time, I didn't want to take medicine for this. I was adamant I could figure it out without external factors. But this arrogance had a hefty toll. The OCD manifested in voices that would rattle in my head every minute of every day. It felt like a nightmare. I would later read in my journal entries where I, as an unshakable agnostic, was begging God to make the voices go away. OCD pushed me to a point where I was willing to try anything spiritual, even anything religious. But this time, I turned to Buddhism, as I'd already been an avid meditator for years, to fill that hole of self-discovery that seemed to be ripped right open. That, mainly, combined with some much-needed medicine and cognitive therapy, was absolutely transformative. I feel so incredibly lucky I'm no longer living in this mental health hell. But this story is one with a good outcome. The solutions of today were effective, but that's not the case for millions of people. Millions of people are quietly suffering, having all of reality warped through the lens of their own perception. I believe that technology can be designed to address lots of these problems directly, helping people to find themselves and hopefully decrease the burden of mental health challenges. Real tech to solve real problems. As the years went on, I got more and more into Buddhism, going to Sunday practices, studying a good bit, and exploring the many wonderful Buddhist temples in Korea. One of the main draws is how different it was. We see practices like meditation going mainstream because it's science backed. Coming from the inverse direction, Buddhism, specifically Tibetan Buddhism, has been very receptive and interested in modern science, creating entire organizations and participating in research in neuroscience conferences. Their mutually great relationship with science, along with the foreign elements and past association, made me choose this as a religion to base my spirit tech exploration. There are certainly incredible amounts of profound wisdom that I've yet to discover with Christianity and other religions. I don't intend to leave these religions into my past, but for this project, I wanted to just focus on Buddhism. I think all religions must be respected as rich and meaningful religions for billions of people that they serve. It's a blessing to have all these religions peacefully coexisting on one planet. A book is a technology that can hold information for future retrieval, allowing generations to access the wealth of information transcribed onto it. Wouldn't it be great if this technology was used to hold important information pertaining to a religion? Well, that's the Bible, or the Quran, or the Tripakata. Wouldn't it be incredible if this technology was thin, and pocket size, fit with translations, video, and audio, introducing the Bible app. Most of these technologies are still beneficial as they leverage technology to bring people closer to their religion, rather than replace anything essential to it. But that's the key. How can we remain authenticity? That's going to be one of the biggest problems. It seems so easy that we would fall into one of the pitfalls, maybe praising technology, or maybe missing core elements from ignorance. After all, some parts might not be able to be engineered, and how are we supposed to find that right balance? 
But how would traditions be different? How would these religions have formed if the people who perpetuated these traditional practices had access to newer tech, like VR? What about neurofeedback? It's not like these technologies were swept aside for better ones in the past. They simply weren't around back then. Spiritual experiences as we know it has been constrained by the inventions of the past, but now the barriers for modern spirit tech are crumbling. One side effect of being such intelligent animals is that we're obsessed with understanding the world around us. It pains us not to understand our own questions. That's one of the major draws of both religion and science. Both fields, to an extent, seek to understand the true nature of reality. So it makes sense that historically, there's been related conflicts between the two. We understand now that stars are not holes to heaven. We understand now that diseases are caused by viruses and bacteria, rather than God's will on groups of people. We understand now how Earth is ancient and we are evolved animals sharing almost all the DNA with the monkeys before us. These discoveries have shattered entire worldviews, and the related scientific power has launched us into creating many of the technologies we have now. Modern science has slowly answered more and more questions that previously religions were to answer. Now, debates linger on where religious leaders and scientists are pitted head to head in debates. It seems as if it's religion or science. But this new view completely neglects the possible harmony that has been proven in the past. We're forgetting the opposite side of the coin. Newton used to read the Bible to find secrets to the universe, the groundbreaking theory of the Big Bang created by a Christian scientist. Obviously, science isn't independent of these spiritual beliefs. After all, the ability for both religion and science to provide answers to these questions don't have to cause conflict, because these questions don't have to overlap. One can obviously believe in God without denying evolution. The conflict is fabricated as much by the person who denies well-accepted science for religion as a person who denies religion for science. It's a two-way gridlock where only hatred is bred and the noise creates tension that doesn't have to exist. Many questions, even questions previously regarded as answered by religions, will enter the realm of science as technology keeps improving. But some questions may very well be beyond the scope of science. And faith-based answers in those respects shouldn't be judged harshly if they aren't skewing scientific progress. Both sides are people trying to make sense of the world. Harmony can exist. For this project, I've identified three of the most promising technologies I could get my hands on. There is so much more to be explored in the future. Some notable spiritual technologies are psychedelics that many report inducing some of the single most important spiritual experiences of their life, ultrasound stimulation, which has shown tremendous results in inducing deep meditative states, and artificial intelligence chatbots, robots that impart wisdom and guidance. All these areas will continue to grow in the coming decades, but I had to limit the scope of this documentary to just three main technologies. For less than $200, and from some retail stores, anyone can pick up devices that use EEG. These devices detect postsynaptic potentials via electrodes that can rest on your scalp. Although this raw brain data is incredibly difficult to decipher, many smart neuroscientists have done the work to do just that. And once we understand this data, we can control technology through our thoughts. People can already have conversations from America to China without speaking a single word, without even knowing each other's language. Thoughts to words, thoughts to games, thoughts to anything electronic is already upon us, and many top entrepreneurs seek to push this even further, with more and more data being read. For this documentary, I got my hands on a Muse device. It monitors your brain waves and plays sounds to help you refocus as you meditate. Providing mental benchmarks for these spiritual practices aren't cheating in a way that an athlete using a stopwatch to monitor their times isn't cheating. It's just a means to understand and improve. Many meditators swear by this technology. People report heightened spiritual experiences using these devices. Their positive experiences must at least be some measure of authenticity. This device will help me focus on my meditation so I can hopefully reach certain milestones quicker. Although this device is rather basic compared to other BCIs, it's certainly a section of spirit tech that is too promising to ignore. Having neurofeedback is an invaluable asset in any practice that benefits from benchmarks. Number two is brain stimulation. On the other side of the coin, brain stimulation has proven itself to work on a freakish level. We've been able to control basic neural activity with electrical stimulation for a long time now. Many insects have super simple neural circuits that we could simply hijack with our own electrical circuits. But even for brains that are many orders of magnitude more complex than insects, 
were able to not only decipher brainwaves, but influence them to a large extent. PEMF, Pulsed Electromagnetic Fields Technology, shows that the presence of electromagnetic fields outside of the brain has the ability to change brainwave with a literal press of a button. We are able to achieve different mental states, and the ease has never been seen before in human history. Like the brain reading, the technology hasn't evolved to the point of being a staple technology for everyone. It's still very expensive, and the benefits are not anywhere near what they could hypothetically be. It's still in its infancy, but the path is starting to take shape. For spiritual meditation purposes, these devices can allow meditative states of focus to be achieved faster and more intensely with this external influence changing internal brain patterns. Number three is virtual reality. Virtual reality is a technology that the general public is very familiar with. To a much greater extent, what we now see, we can control. What we now hear, we can control. Even senses like what we feel or what we smell seem to be possible to mimic. And because the brain constructs perceptions based on all available input, we can trick our bodies into these imagined creations. And we aren't even constrained by mimicking reality. Here's an example of an abstract VR experience meant to replicate just the visual aspect of Hindu Vedas. Many top companies are racing to be leaders in this field. It seems like there's an absolutely massive market to provide virtual experiences to the customer. It doesn't need to be constrained to just corporate profit, however. Having virtual reality provided for us by these devices doesn't take away from their true ability to impact real human experience. What we see in here has always been a critical part in how one experiences spirituality. Spiritual practices have always focused on the senses, with beautiful art and architecture for the eyes, music for the ears, and unique smells and tastes like incense. But we've never had this degree of control over all these senses. Spiritual experiences can now truly be cracked open to our collective creativity. For this particular exploration, I'll be using a special app I created for virtual reality. I call it the Lucid Dream Machine. This app, along with some outside hardware, is supposed to induce and teach lucid dreaming control. Here's a rundown video I made for the professor explaining how it works. It's kind of rough. For the past couple months, I've been creating a device to stimulate and control lucid dreaming. What the fuck? And then, uh, man, time's gonna rewind. But it really does get the heart pounding. It's a weird, really weird feeling. To lucid dream. To lucid dream is to be aware you're dreaming as you dream. But can it be learned? Not only are there numerous very effective studies showing techniques to induce lucid dreams today, the practice of purposely lucid dreaming is ancient. A prime example is dream yoga, where monks would purposely meditate in their dreams for a heightened meditative experience. The most effective technique studied currently is before you go to bed, you think through the events of your entire day. From there, when you're actually dreaming and living through your day in the dream state, you remember the recollections. This project aims to use VR to stimulate this before bed recollection process and then stimulates three situations one might be in while lucid dream. The first is flying, because it's a classic benchmark of control. Meditation, because it's said to be more intense while lucid. And fears, because lucid dream therapy has proven very effective at decreasing anxiety. The struggle is getting into the lucid state and then having control. These are the roadblocks focused on in this project. How am I gonna go about this? The subject will record their day with a 360 camera, and then before bed, thanks to a Python script, You'll be able to watch their day speed up with some new tweaks, like time going backwards at points and trippy audio edits. Next, the VR headset will simulate the next stage of the lucid dream practice. This will be the home screen where people can pick between flying, meditation, or scared. For flight, I was inspired by the videos that use optical illusions to make you nauseous, and then they switch really quick to clouds so it feels like you're flying. I thought that'd be way more potent in virtual reality. For Scare, I wanted to make it really simple. I just gave it a video of something that I'm personally afraid of, the deep ocean. And then for the meditation, I went to a monastery in Korea and took a 360 video. I also used GPTJ, an open source AI, to create new guided meditation scripts each time you meditated in the simulated lucid state. Welcome back to this guided meditation. Finally, I packed a backpack full of microcontrollers, which, connected to a virtual reality headset, would blow wind on you in a way that made you feel like you were actually flying in a flight simulation, and then would vibrate a motor over your heart during the scare simulation, 
tricking your brain that your heart is actually beating fast and you're indeed scared. And after months of banging my head against the wall, annoying my girlfriend to death, and losing all the Korean friends I had, I think I created something wonderful. It would be a waste if I totally neglect the incredible technology and spirituality in America. Acknowledging this fact, I'm going to start this journey by going around my home city, Colorado Springs, and visit some real-life churches. There's over 400 churches in this one city, but I only have time to go to a couple. One of the main ones being New Life Mega Church. In addition, and to set the stage for the rest of the Spirit Tech exploration, I'm going to interview the founder of the very first virtual reality church, and then interview one of the authors of the book that inspired this entire documentary. I'll arrive in Nepal on the 5th, passing through Texas and Qatar, sparing two days for just adjusting to all the craziness of the two-day flight to a third world country. On the 7th, I'll begin with the first meditation retreat. I'll vlog as many parts of this experience as I can with the limited technology they allow. For the first part of this exploration, I think it's fine if the spiritual technology is limited. Buddhists have obviously had great spiritual experience over thousands of years prior. Additionally, I want to make sure that I go into this endeavor respectfully and fully understand the boundaries that need to be set. It seems almost inconsiderate and douchey to pull up with technology like I know better. I obviously don't. I need to learn meditation and Buddhism before any technological modifications. Afterwards, I'm going to engage in another retreat of some type. This one hasn't been planned yet. I think I'll just let the momentum of my first experience guide me forward from that point on. Before and after these retreats, I'll experiment with the spirit tech devices that I brought. I want to take measures of my brain waves before and after with the EEG device and also meditate with the brain writing device to compare and contrast as the experiences of normal meditation will still be fresh in my mind post retreat. Also, during these transitional periods before bed, I'll use my VR headset and the app I made to try to induce a lucid dream and then hopefully take control of it and meditate. Enter the 10,000 member New Life Megachurch. They are famous for their multi-thousand seat halls and rock concerts as part of their Sunday Mass. This was certainly an interesting first experience for this project. I've never been to such a lively church. When the band really got going, there was a palpable energy in the air. When I think of church music, I think of a two-ton organ and some vocalists singing the words from a crusty Bible. But this was so positively new. It was also interesting how much technology they integrated into everything. People were watching in virtually, and many of the people who were there in person use technology to connect with the church, find the mass times, and then would even wave their phone flashlight in the air during mellow parts of the songs. It was clear that there'd been so much modern change, but still, there was something missing. Although technology was omnipresent, none of it was used in novel ways. I still had so many questions about spirit tech, so I started setting up interviews. At this point, I had some interviews, with, but there were still many questions that lingered. That's when I got in contact with Dr. Stockley, a Boston University professor who co-authored the book Spirit Tech. She had been deep in this research for years and was literally an expert in this field. But I still needed something more, someone with their hands currently in the implementation of spiritual technology. Introducing DJ Soto. Okay, my next guest is a pastor of a growing congregation, but his church, let's just say it's out of this world. Welcome, Pastor DJ Soto. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Okay, so you are the first pastor of a virtual reality church. I got in contact with him in Discord after reading a chapter about him in the Spirit Tech book. When I told him he was in the book, he said he hadn't even read it. That gave me a strong impression of who he is as a person. He doesn't need validation. He's a pioneer. I knew I had to interview him, but first I had to have a taste of his creation. Entering the virtual church was very strange. I'm already not an avid churchgoer, and being in a virtual one made me feel more uncomfortable. This melted away pretty fast, however. It was absolutely stunning, with skies that seemed to be painted like starry night. Additionally, no one knew who I was. It felt like the judgment was left back in the real world. It didn't make me act without restraint, instead it made me focus more. At the very start, some avatar came over to me and said hi. This was surprising. In a mega church with thousands of people, only one person talked to me. And he was asking about my suspicious camera equipment. Here, people were all super friendly. The church was pretty straightforward at the beginning. We just watched a video on the screen and listened to a mass. 
Instead of just sitting there, we followed his avatar into a theater representative of some valuable passage. In the theater, we had 3D visual models of what was happening, along with DJ Sermon. Sermon wasn't any less raw and emotional despite it being virtual. There were times of sincerity, even times of DJ choking up. I can't, can't underestimate y'all when I hear, <laughs> this is what I want. Whew, I'm getting emotional thinking about this and I don't want to spend too long on it. When I see the church today, and I see how the church treats other people, and I look at the words of Jesus and how Jesus interacted with other people. Jesus was always kind to the sinner. But the people that he didn't pull back any punches for, from, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, full of hypocrisy and lawlessness, you're shiny on the outside, but you're full of garbage on the inside. Those things Jesus said to the church of that time to the arrogant religion of the time, to the people who set themselves up in this hierarchy of power over others and told them that they were the ones that knew how to commune with God. Those are the people that Jesus spoke these words to. And when I see the church today, it grieves my heart because I feel like as a whole, it's so backwards. We watched through scene by scene, and everyone there was so respectful of the Mass. Afterwards, many avatars came up to me and introduced themselves. Later, I called DJ and asked him some questions. Yeah, sorry, I, I was, I was kind of late. <laughs> hey, no worries. Computers are difficult. <laughs> yeah, they are. Mid-interview, talking about the downsides of technology, my internet cut out. <laughs> okay, I felt like the foundations were fully formed after those conversations. Time to leave America. If I go forever, if I become a monk, are you gonna try to find me? Yes. The trip started oddly emotional. Usually at the beginning of trips, I feel exhilaration with a rush of nervousness creeping in from the back. I've traveled many times before and usually felt that feeling, but this time I felt something completely new, something unknown and a bit frightening. Leaving Colorado Springs, I felt a kind of emotion I couldn't identify. A little bit of fear and a little bit of sadness, a little bit of excitement. Leaving today makes everything seem so real. Leaving today is the end of an era of my life and the beginning of a totally new path. Leaving today is the remnants of a conscious choice to limit all possible hometown adventures I could have had with my girlfriend and close college friends. Goodbye again to my family. Goodbye again to all other loved ones. It's time for this adventure. They're happy for me, but I know some would rather me stay. I'll be back in six months, but I think there will be changes. We won't be too different, probably, and we still will have a great time when we do hang out again, hopefully. And that's what's making me feel this emotion. It's a response to two parts of me splitting in half in the midst of an unstoppable rolling of time. I'll hopefully enjoy my life during this time, and hopefully others will enjoy theirs. But regardless of these two realities being different, we'll both get older. One more step closer to another unchangeable turning page, another end of an era. Every choice carries enormous value for yourself and others around you. And then these choices manifest into changes, pages, turning, new chapters with old ones forever gone. I wanna make sure the choices I make are the right ones. Am I doing this adventure solely for myself? Is this wrong? When time chugs along, will I regret these choices? It's an incredible wait, and I hope this adventure is not the wrong choice. Just writing this between long glances out the window. Seeing the many houses below the plane dotting the landscape is comforting. Just a bunch of other people in the same predicament, making choices as they flow through time. I may not know if this choice is right, but at least it's in line with the predicaments of other humans. That makes me feel not as alone. There was a lot of time in the Texas airport for me just to think. Mostly, my thoughts drifted back to the documentary. I knew spirituality and technology are entire enormous sections of study. How would I make a documentary that could introduce this to someone who hadn't thought much about it before? How do I make this engaging, true to myself, grounded, true to the questions at the heart of spiritual technology? I want this to be thoughtful and inspiring, but I have no experience making films, no experience with the camera. Usually, there's entire teams dedicated to this process. Not just one guy with no experience and a week of editing time. 
These thoughts lay dormant in my head through the entire travel process. I think I really doubted myself. The 14-hour plane ride that followed to Qatar didn't seem that long. Usually, 14-hour plane rides are brutal, but I was weirdly okay with it this time. The food may have been why. I thought it was better than most restaurants. Solid 8. Walking into the Qatar airport, I saw so many beautiful art pieces. This made up for the extreme heat in the middle of the night. Seeing the high technology of this country made me think about how little appreciation I have for today's tech. It's so hard for technological change to happen, but once it does, everything feels normal again. I feel like I've slipped into a sci-fi movie, but at such a gradual pace, I still can't accept how wild things are. Many of you watching this have content diets determined not by people, but by algorithms. Every time you're driving on the highway and see a Tesla, there's a good chance it's in self-driving mode. You have computers on your wrists, in your pocket, in your glasses. And these are just commercially available products. I'm always amazed at how small trickles compile into tsunamis. I feel like spiritual technologies will feel very similar, but with a very higher entry threshold. The tech will enter and be a little controversial, maybe even comical at first but it'll get better and eventually have a large enough impact on people that people won't have to wonder if it's authentic. Once it's clearly affecting people's lives and is now the new norm, it'll seem old fashioned for people to be wary of it. It's like we're trained to accept technology at a super rapid pace. Something crazy to us now will eventually feel like how we perceive the Bible app today. Just a part of life, just an evolution of an age old thing. But in the midst of being unappreciative and adaptive, real progress marches on. At some point, we might look back and be bewildered, but most of the efforts will be in the push towards progress, however that is defined by the systems that guide us. Arriving in Nepal was beautiful beyond imagination. We descended from the clouds over the Himalayas with the bright Kathmandu colors dotting the landscape in the distance. I felt no wonder I hadn't felt before in a long time. Something seemed epic about this place, a certain mystique it was present in the air. Seeing the sights of the mountains really put into perspective the story of the Buddha. If one man would sit under a lotus tree and conquer his own mind, it would make sense that it would be done in such a place. The scene was set so perfectly, I had no doubt the Buddha was born here. Some taxi driver came to me, excited, in the airport. That should have been the first warning sign, his eagerness. I didn't mind, I spent the first day in Nepal going absolutely everywhere with him. In retrospect, this adventure was a bit too crazy first day. I was so tired of travel and jet lag, but regardless, we toured everywhere in Kathmandu. Later, I'd be going back to these places anyways. First, we saw Bodhna Stupa, where the remains and relics of the Buddha are still held, along ancient and famous Tibetan trade routes, and nestled in the chaotic mix of all sorts of residences and businesses. Bhutanath introduced me to what Nepal was really about. Craziness, energy, Buddhism, all kinds of people on every single corner, all the time. Next we went to Patan Durbar Square, where I tried some of the most exotic street food I've ever had in my entire life. Some of it was wonderful, and some of it tasted like rotting potatoes. Later in the trip I realized it was indeed rotting potatoes, and the vendor we got it from wasn't reputable. Luckily, I'm lactose intolerant, so all it took was a bit of ice cream and I was deep cleaned from the inside out. The food was incredible. I knew that the following days as a monk was going to be a diet without any meat, so I made sure to get my Momo fix in while I could. There were people dancing in the street, wearing clothes I previously only saw in movies. Traditions I didn't understand at all. At all, at all. Wonderfully exotic. Even the jet lag couldn't break my engagement that day. We then went on a wonderful zip line where we could see Kathmandu in the Himalayas as a backdrop. On the top, we laughed about horses and talked about cows. We almost hit a cow on the way up. The driver was very shaken. He said that killing a cow in Nepal would give him as much jail time as killing a human. I told him in America, cows are far from sacred animals. Similar to the cows, the monkeys were protected and nurtured. We saw massive groups of them at the top of Swambu, where another wonderful stupa stood tall. This one elevated so a complete view of Kathmandu was present. It made sense that this was part of people's Buddhist pilgrimage. Swambu, or monkey temple, was truly breathtaking. It was becoming clear to me how much I had to ingest about Buddhism if I was going to make the Spirit Tech documentary. It's always hard to know how little you know. I arrived at Kopan very late the previous night, basically the next day. There were many tiny Buddhist monks to greet me at the front gate. 
we had to turn off all the distracting technology that we brought, so I made sure to use my brain reading device beforehand while I still could. I made sure my camera was also with me for the entirety of the course. After two days of travel, and the complete madness of the first day in Kathmandu, I crashed. When I woke up, I went around and explored some parts of the monastery. I met some of the people I was going to spend the next five days with. They were some of the most interesting people I ever met. Many of them were there to seek some type of spiritual escape in this Buddhist environment. This trip was just one of their many trips on their spiritual journey. There were dentists, CEOs, marketers, engineers, all super traditionally successful people that I wouldn't expect to see at a monastery like this. Many were from Germany, but there was also representation from the UK, France, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain. I had a fact check that was an actual country, sorry Hassan. It was interesting how many people there were that weren't Buddhist, mostly Christian and Muslim. Later on in the day, the monks would say that Buddhism isn't a religion, like we see religions in the West. It's a philosophy. The gods are representations of ideas, not some divine, real entity. My mind was already starting to spin. Buddhism, not a religion? What was I getting myself into? I was already confused. The second day of the course began at an ungodly hour for my standards. Waking up at 6am was a feat I hadn't done for 20 years of my life. Bugs started to eat me alive, and I'm very, very allergic to insects. So in a couple hours, I looked like the Michelin star mascot. It made for funny jokes though, so I didn't mind. Stay present, focus on the sensation, even if the sensation is your hand puffing up like a marshmallow. Having a straight posture for the meditations was grueling on a level I didn't expect upon entering. I was shaking, biting my tongue violently. I wanted to just be mindful of the pain, but it was too much to bear at the beginning. Instead, I just suffered. I figured it'd get better with time. At that point, I felt like I simply didn't have the muscles for good posture. During the teachings, I was surprised by how little the Buddhists seemed to care about promoting their religion, philosophy, their philosophy? They talked about how we must first understand, and then practice, and then accept. What spiritual leader says, don't believe what I say? They also talked about how wonderful other religions are, with helping people in their lives. They really loved the other religions, as they were helping other people so much. One of the best moments was before the teaching, the monk took out his iPhone 13 and turned it to silent. I don't think anyone else saw it, but I thought it was the funniest thing. So many unexpected moments. He went around the room asking us to introduce ourselves in our native language. We had to say good morning. Guten Morgen. Bonjour. For me, I said in America, they would say morning, y'all. It was really nice having so much time just to study Buddhist texts. I had a lot of trouble understanding core basic ideas like enlightenment. Later on, I asked one of them and they explained it to me, pretty thoroughly. In studying Buddhism, I get hung up on what it means to let go of self. There's so many levels of confusion with that statement. Digging deeper into what the Zen masters say, I understand being enlightened is to be disillusioned that that part of you is concretely you. Close your eyes. Actually, close your eyes. There's not going to be any images. Imagine what color the sky is. Now imagine what 7 times 5 is. Imagine Saturn. Now open your eyes. Here's the million dollar question. Where exactly did those thoughts come from? Of course it was spurred by my provocation. But as a matter of experience, those thoughts just appeared in your consciousness. You didn't choose to think it, it more just arise. People see these thoughts and emotions rise out of their consciousness for whatever reason and then equate those thoughts and feelings as themselves. But what's thrust into your mind's eye isn't always your conscious choice. Sure, you can try to induce thought patterns of your own, but what you experience in your consciousness is served to you from a part of your brain that isn't you. This barrier between us and what we observe is what our Buddhist friends say we ignore day to day. We see the anger arise and say we're angry, but we're just observing anger. How can we ourselves be that? We constantly equate what pops into our heads as who we are. This is an illusion. As Sam Harris says, a mirror isn't changed by what it reflects. So if we're not our thoughts and we're not our feelings, then what are we? The idea is that there's no concrete eye, we're always in flux. If you were to describe an ocean, you might start by describing the water, the fish, the seascape. 
But to truly understand the ocean, you would need to understand the full picture. It's an ever-changing, dynamic composition of other similarly impermanent components. Buddhists come to this conclusion at an experiential level after they spend thousands of hours just being present with their thoughts and emotions coming in and out of their consciousness. After seeing these spontaneous thoughts appear, eventually it seems silly to say that's what they are. And then by letting go of this idea of a solid I controlled by thoughts, they broke that illusion. And that's what enlightenment is. At this enlightened point, they're liberated from their thoughts. And afterwards, enlightened people have a much greater capacity for their experience. These monks seem to have new powers, like they can endure incredible pain. These monks can hang around people who used to bother them greatly and not feel anger anymore. Something permanent in them, they report, is forever different. Amongst all the wonderful teachers we had, on this day, one of them really stood out to me. Introducing Nun Kadro. Her English was perfect, and her explanations were always so understandable. She used to live in New Zealand and then South America as a super successful businesswoman. Such a character I had to get to know in an interview. Okay guys, good news. One of the nuns, whose like, background is in neuroscience, she said she'd do an interview with me. Oh my god, I finally got her. Today I went to the monastery looking and I couldn't find, but now... The power of the mind started to come into full perspective today. When I'm happy, everything is wonderful, and when I'm sad, everything is misery. And even though when my mind decides how I experience these life events, I still put so much emphasis on external things. Why am I spending time working on gadgets when I could spend my time meditating? It seems foolish from the point of view that you can actually change how your brain interacts with the stimulus it receives. This stimulus can be thoughts and emotions, but it can also be the raw data you get as a reality. I can change how I interact with reality, however it is. Reformat my brain so it interprets it in a way that's less hurtful. That's one of the main goals of Buddhism. How did I not know about this technique, this philosophy? This is one of the core practices, using their mind to understand and train their mind. When regular people try these practices, they report a huge jump in personal happiness, creativity. It's also scientific. How have I not been exposed to this? After practice today, I remember the TED talk named You Hallucinate Your Conscious Reality. What an insane finding. What we experience as reality is actually a mental construction. And we can influence these mental constructions through Buddhist techniques. It seems like Buddhism is practical neuroscience. I'm pretty convinced at this point. I mean, there's still elements that I can't fully rationalize, like reincarnation and karma. Like, I understand how, to a basic extent, bad actions can cause bad patterns that loop. And then some mental patterns can persist after death, but like not in the concrete way it's described in Buddhism. They actually think some people are reincarnates of others. I don't see any evidence. When I told them this, they said I shouldn't believe it then. I need to rationalize it first. Day seven, I vowed to keep my back as straight as possible. Only 45 minutes, but after the first 30 minutes, each preceding one felt like an hour. Today, the monk answered a question about the hardships of meditation with the phrase, no pain, no gain. People thought that was the absolute funniest thing. So I followed my advice that day. I held my back straight past the 30 minute mark and then the 40 minute mark, past the point I thought was possible for me, far, far past that point. And then in the midst of this breaking, there's a feeling of clarity. These moments of clarity are always strange because I can never predict them accurately. The moments are usually composed of things I know, but I'm a little blinded by some bias or fear. In these moments of clarity, it feels as if my brain puts all the puzzle pieces together and I can finally see the finished picture. Like I live moment by moment, seeing pixels in a picture, but it doesn't mean anything until I take a step back, and the pixels form an image. Like a bird flying over the neighborhood, the full landscape is clear. And this time, during this brief moment, my realization was I wanted a monastery of my own. Meditation had done wonders for me and I really believed that those ideas could help people. But I wanted to bring something new to the table. I don't want this to be a typical monastery. I imagined it as super high tech, a spirit tech monastery per se. 
with 360 cameras, lovely LED displays, group meditation, using brainwave technology, all the newest spirit tech advances that people might not be able to afford on their own. Buddhist at the core, but elevated by science. The vision for this was as clear as day. When the meditation bell rang, I was ecstatic. I had to tell my friends what I just experienced. In the West, whenever I researched about Buddhism, the phrase life is suffering always came up. I used to write this off as an overly pessimistic viewpoint about the world. Now I'm seeing it in a different lens after the lectures today. These monks are some of the happiest and optimistic people I've ever met. Obviously, they don't think all of life is suffering, like the phrase might imply. I looked up what the Dalai Lama said about this quote, and he elucidated it a good bit. The Buddhist view is that as long as you have attachments, that will lead to suffering. It's inescapable, unless you become enlightened. Okay, this opened up another gaping hole in my understanding. What are attachments in Buddhism? Is it like marriage? Well, Buddhism says nothing against marriage. Is it hope? Hoping for things? But the Buddha's teaching is fundamentally hopeful. So I asked one of the nuns. So in this context, the Buddhist definition of attachment is relying on somebody to make you happy instead of the happiness coming from within you, or buying things to make you happy instead of mastering yourself inside out. The key insight is that happiness comes from within. Talking in the group discussion that day, everyone was so curious with the documentary that I'm making. I'm the youngest person here alone, and very far from home. They like the concept, and it's nice to see other people passionate about this. But my purpose for being here felt so surface level compared to other people's motives. One guy told me of how he came here on a whim and then stayed for the last 12 years of his life because it alleviated many of his mental health issues. Others here had accidents and divorces. It was really heavy talks, but also really moving to see everyone bond over wanting to decrease human suffering. We went to the nearby nunnery, and this was one of my favorite experiences during this retreat. I couldn't distinguish the little nuns from the little monks. At one point in life, they're just tiny humans with robes and really friendly tiny humans at that. We walked into their classes, and they all welcomed us. We must have seemed super interesting and foreign. I didn't want to record them too much because I felt like I was intruding. During the journey, we followed a blind dog around the main monastery. I don't think that there's many places this safe for a blind dog. Although seemingly helpless, he still knew his way around the place miraculously. We followed him up the steps into this temple. I felt inspired by how well this dog could navigate and live life. He still smiled, still wagged his tail, and still found the Buddha temple. That night I did some reflecting. I'm so incredibly uncomfortable, but happy in this retreat. I haven't felt such a big disconnect before like this in my life. My joints are in so much pain from the bug bites in the city. The bed is so hard, the showers are ice cold, but strangely I'm content. I guess this is something I've wanted to do for a long time and I'm realizing this dream. Today Hassan told me not to cut my hair, but I'm at a monastery. I'll soon be living the monkhood life. It's time to remove that attachment. So many lovely people I've met here. I'm going to miss them all. Also, as one final goodbye, Nada and I played a song for the group. It felt very spiritual. I think it brought everyone a lot of peace. I spent the next two days going on adventures with some friends I made. Hassan from Bahrain and Nada from Saudi Arabia. We joked that they were my new parents, as there were no other parental figures here to save me from my own destructive habits. That day, the sightseeing began. We visited the monkey stupa again. They all seemed uncannily human. We got blessed by a real-life Hindu goddess girl. She seemed so ambivalent to all the tourists getting the head dot. We ate wonderful food, partied at the death parade, and then watched them burn the bodies. It saddened me that the smell of humans burning was akin to Korean barbecue. Maybe being vegetarian was good for now. Nada talked about signing up for this Vipassana meditation camp. 10 days of no speaking, no writing, phones, reading, 10 days of just meditation. She called up the center and said I was her son and that I wanted to join. 
Usually getting in is selective, and should be done three months in advance, but somehow, she got the spot for me. Holy moly. It was time to shave my head completely and buy a robe. Full monk mode. But before I jumped into this experience, I had to realign with the goal. How do we make authentic spirit tech? I know I had more of a taste of Buddhism, but I still hadn't mixed it much yet with the technology post-retreat. It seemed like a necessary practice if I was to explore this question. So I tracked my brainwaves with the Muse device and induced new states with the Omniper immediately after finishing and found some interesting results. My meditation got better, of course, according to the graphs, but it was nice to see exactly how much better it got. Putting numbers to things can miss the bigger picture, but it's also essential in training. A benchmark, maybe not the full picture, but a benchmark of improvement was evident. Before this technology, there really was no way to objectively measure brain states accurately, so I think this was game changing. And it felt authentic as well. There's still an astronomical amount of pain and boredom someone must do in this meditation process. As far as the brain writing device, I noticed a slight increase in my ability to get into that deep flow state when I used it. Nothing too extreme, but I think noticeable. And back the technology went into the luggage. It was then time for Vipassana. I felt so stupid when I entered. Nobody here shaved their head. They asked me if I was a monk, and some people were bowing to me in this. The fact of what I was doing started to sink in. An intensive retreat after an intensive retreat? In retrospect, it sounds really stupid, especially when taking into account how intense the second retreat was. Back in the first retreat, we meditated less than four hours a day, but here, it would sharply spike to 14 hours a day. Maybe it wouldn't be a problem, I told myself. I'll buckle down and shut up for 10 days, I told myself. Whoa, I told myself wrong. That night, we got there and we immediately began meditating. And I got this creepy feeling of OCD in the back of my mind, tickling my spine. I didn't really care much about it. Usually the OCD came and it went and I could distract myself. I fought this demon before, no worries. So I just continued on with my meditation until night. The beds were comically hard. As part of the practice, we were supposed to give up comfort and instead be present with the pain of the bed. Okay, whatever. Another inconvenience, but I could manage it. That night, we ate beans. Beans every day, every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Beans, beans, beans. I would meditate just on beans. Waking up at 4 a.m. in the morning really is a good way to shock your body into productivity. The first day was a shot of adrenaline that sent my body into hyper-focus mode. The first two hour meditation in the morning felt like it took forever. Even just two hours straight of meditation would be a feat that I normally wouldn't do in a normal day. Focusing on the sensation of your nose during the breath seems easy, but in practice I couldn't do it for over 10 seconds. I found my mind always wondering, but I buckled down and brought my attention back. Again and again and again. Here's the schedule. 4 a.m. wake up bell. Meditate for two hours, then eat breakfast for an hour. The breakfast was quite bad, despite my body craving the food. But for free, I really couldn't complain. The next three hours, we just sat with a straight back, focusing on the meditation. I would always have a bad posture at school in those chairs, but here, I long for any kind of back support. Having a straight back is quite uncomfortable with only a cushion. 14 hours of meditating was far more exhausting than running a marathon. At 11, we had a lunch break. The next hour after lunch, we had nothing to do. My brain initially kept chugging as the momentum of always having a stimulus kept me alert. I couldn't face my mind just yet. Instead, I walked around the small area trying to explore every nook and cranny. After the break, I decided to briefly talk to my teacher, as only during 12, I could break the vow of silence and talk to him, but only for emergencies. I had a horrible feeling in my gut because I forgot to tell my parents what I was doing and inform Caroline of what exactly I was getting myself into. And for 10 days, there would be no contact. He was very understanding but adamant. I couldn't have my phone back at all. I couldn't even have it a bit to call. He said my mind would wonder too much and I needed to only have my thoughts. I kept begging, this time for other things, asking him if I could use any of my meditation devices. He told me I wasn't allowed to see anything, do anything. I was trapped here for the next nine days. The initial ping of being uncomfortable began to expand, but I agreed with him. 
day one, maybe a little headspace could be nice. After all, what better way to get in touch with myself? Following that conversation was four more hours of meditation. This is where physical pain begins to get really gnarly. After the course, one guy admitted the hardest thing was the physical aspect. And these four hours comprised most of the pain. At one point, we'd been meditating for five hours, so there wasn't much strength left in our backs and our knees had quite a lot. Focus on the pain. Be present with the pain. At five, we would eat fruit and cereal. I didn't miss meat on day one, but man did I want a good dinner. Going to bed hungry was an experience that was totally new to me. After dinner, we would meditate for an hour and then watch a video explaining the technique in another hall. This video watching part was the best of the days, just to hear another human talking on the screen, even if it was fairly boring and monotone. It was just so nice to not be meditating. Seeing this Indian teacher talk about Buddhism was never something I thought I would savor. He really focused hard on Buddhism being scientific and non-secretarian. Immediately after the video, my mind started to race again. I had to find a way to get all my things back, to call my family. I had to call my family. They couldn't get in the way of something that important, could they? Day two, I felt another rush of hopelessness. I wasn't even close to halfway. At this point, all I could do was limit my vision of the future. Just one more day, just one more day, just one more breath, one more breath. During the moments of the day, I ran out of places to explore. I instead just sat there and observed my own thoughts. Just let my brain be free. And I noticed a lot of random trash floating in my head. Unlike the first retreat, I thought less about things people said that I'd now have a good report to. Instead, it seemed like my brain was probing deep, just trying to make sense of distant memories. Now things that popped up weren't agitating, more just random. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose. Shiny? Shiny things don't glow. They reflect light, not emit light. That makes no sense. Oh my god, is Avatar about Tibet? Tibet is a peaceful nation of monks who lived in the mountains and had bisons and monkeys and got invaded by China and the most popular dish is Momo, oh my god. That would be hilarious if I had a pig named Porkchop. My mom always called my dad Porkchop. Earbuds should have noise cancelling. But like, dynamic. Ugh, I don't think I like fig newtons. The random thoughts were abundant, but also were equally accompanied by sad thoughts. This type of meditation is called prison meditation. It made sense that it would work well with prisons, as the environment was very much like one. Crazy restricted, crazy uncomfortable, bad beds, bad food, just you and your mind. The isolation led me to many sad thoughts. These thoughts naturally build up to a point of breaking. Suddenly and explosively, I started to cry. I tried my best to stay silent, to not disturb other people, but the workers there could see I had profound sadness on my face. It was an ugly, ugly cry. I hadn't cried for a really long time before this moment, but something about the intensity of the chorus broke me down. It felt like I was letting go of heavy emotional burdens, doing surgery on my own mind, but consciously. It hurt like hell, but at the end of the day, I felt better. Day three, I went up to the master crying and asked him if I could go. The wave of sadness came over me again, and this time it was too much. He said it'd be one of the greatest mistakes of my life and I'd regret leaving. But I wanted my technology. I needed it. It felt like the only portal I had to what mattered. And the technologies they used here, the TV, the books, the bell, it was just primitive. I felt like I was stuck in a nightmare that took place in the past. I couldn't stand it. Laying on the bench, contemplating these thoughts, I realized that this was killing me and I couldn't take it anymore. So... After the first morning meditation, I ran away. They took all my technology, but I snuck in my camera just in case. I went back into my room, got my camera, and started recording myself. Watching the recording back on the screen, I saw someone who looked completely insane, someone who was destroyed. Who knew that three days of isolation could wreck me so completely? Seeing myself in the camera made me know that things were not okay. I slipped on my shoes, looked around for workers, and slowly started to walk towards the course boundaries. At the boundary, I probed my surroundings one more time to make sure the coast was clear. It was. The time to go was now, so I ran, 
My initial stillness was quickly cut with a sudden blast of movement, and I approached the front of the meditation center where I was dropped off initially. My heart was beating. I hoped they didn't catch me, but I had to leave this place. I was going insane. By the time I got to the gate, to my horror, it was locked. I filmed a bit of the moment as I pressed my hand against the door longingly. The outside was so close, but this cold metal barrier was here and I couldn't just get past it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw one of the Dharma workers rounding the corner. My heart dropped and I began to sprint back. By the time he could see me, I had already fled a good ways. I went back into my room and put my chest flat on the bed, taking quick and violent breaths. I kept thinking in my head, there's no way that this is understanding Buddhism. I then curled up into a ball in the corner and just rubbed my head. Now a little prickly, because a little hair had grown. Oh god, I had no idea how I was going to survive another seven days. Rubbing my head brought me back to the present moment eventually, and I felt my brain starting to settle down. I told myself that I at least had to know if I was capable. More than that, I would stay at least for today because yes, this process was hard, but maybe it had benefits. This might be the process for understanding and purifying the mind. How I am on the inside is how I'll treat loved ones, so I vowed to stay a bit longer, if only for them. Later that day, the same Dharma worker was serving my food. He gave me an extra scoop of rice, something no one else got. He smiled and said after winter is spring. I think he saw that something was wrong, or at least knew something was off. Regardless of the reason, the kindness struck me between the eyes. That was a very emotional lunch. On day four, I started to feel how profoundly strange silence is. At least in my normal day-to-day -day life, there's always something. I'm not talking about sound, I'm talking about mental chatter. It seems normal that there's always something in the mind. At home, I'm always in the state of thinking without mindfulness. After all, life is always too busy for too much mindfulness, right? But here, by the third day, my brain was clear of other thoughts. I didn't forcefully or judgmentally push the thoughts away. I'd been doing the opposite. I was just present, just observing. And by doing this, I felt like I was untangling the negativity associated with the thoughts. And that negativity gave those thoughts power. Now they could just float away from my brain freely. We were to, three times a day, stay completely still with a straight back during the meditations. Usually, we could adjust if the pain was bad, but for these three one-hour sittings, we were just supposed to absorb the pain. Additionally, instead of focusing on the sensation of your nose as you breathe, we were told to focus on sensations throughout the body, scanning down from the top of the head. The change was welcome. A new method of meditation was exciting. Things started to look up now. The sittings got easier. People eating a diet of old beans and farting in the meditation hall started to fill me with joy. I got in the rhythm of sleeping during the breaks and then taking long showers. I felt like I was getting better at the meditative process. It didn't feel like I was wasting my time. I felt like I was going to some goal. The bed annoyed me less. The food got better as I felt more and more hungry as the days went on. The OCD started to get worse, but I didn't care. I was ecstatic about all the other things, and I started to get deep benefits as well. During one of the meditations, when we were told to focus on any sensation, I noticed a slight tickle on the top of my head. This amazed me. No matter what body part, with enough mindful awareness and training, you could pick out the smallest sensations. Here, it was just a microscopic tingle, but my attention had been honed down enough to detect it. As I noticed the tingle, and I focused on it, the sensation started to grow. It was as if my brain knew it was being conscious of itself, and started rewarding me. It felt like an internal brain massage. The feeling got more and more intense as I focused on this feeling, and then suddenly, it felt as if my whole head was being massaged from the inside out at every point of my scalp. It was one of the most pleasurable experiences in my life. So much so, it felt dirty, something I shouldn't be doing in a meditation hall. Still wanting it to be over, counting down the days and time intervals. I told myself I could do it. I was already two-thirds done. This was the only day I didn't cry and go to the teacher asking him if I could leave or call. At this point, I had been meditating almost 70 hours and I started to become hyper-conscious of every single movement. It was as if the meditative state did not stop after the scheduled meditations. They more morphed into different types of meditation. During the day, I noticed my reactions to things lessening as I refined my ability to observe. 
So I continued this practice, pushing myself during the still sittings to not move at all. Deep throbbing and pain resided in my back and a sharp pain in both knees. The feeling started strong and got more and more unbearable. I'm in pain, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, I'm in pain. The lazy part of my brain was squirming or going absolutely nuts. It was just shouting that I had to stop. But after 20 minutes, that part of my brain seemed to resign. The pain was still there and I still experienced it to its full extent, but it's like my brain gave up the aversion and I could just accept it. You just notice it, like the breaths. And it didn't feel like I was lapsing out of consciousness or anything like when you run so hard your brain turns off. No, I still had clarity, control over my reaction. If only for a couple seconds, I felt liberated. And the pain was now in the background. And as the pain was in the background, my OCD began to replace it as the main sensation in my mind. But my mind was still in observation mode. I saw the OCD come up, and instead of reacting, I just experienced it. All the darkness, all the absurdity. It was like I became those thoughts, those voices that for so long I felt were inescapable. And in the process of becoming them, I felt like I could beat them. Day 7, I woke up begrudgingly to the 4am bell. I really thought it'd get easier as the time went on, but it wasn't easy at all. I kept struggling to get to the hall on time. Waking up made it feel like all the progress of the past was for nothing. Each day was its own mountain. Today we had to do the same meditation that we'd been doing for the last couple of days, being mindful of the sensations in the body. For some reason, the OCD waves were back, and this time, they were stronger. It's all about starving OCD with attention, with all the will you can muster. And here, I was too weak not to give it attention. That's a true blessing of the Western world. It's so easy to distract yourself if you want. But here, there's nothing else to focus on. I could try meditating, but I'd always lose the battle of focus. And then things really started to spiral downhill. You know that sinking feeling you get when something really bad happens in a nightmare? It felt like that was a continuous state of mind for all of day seven. Even when I was eating the bland beans between meals, even when I was watching the Dharma talks, every waking moment, I couldn't shake off this feeling of despair. It no longer felt like I was improving myself, or even on the path. I told myself to wait one more day. The teacher saw how anxious I was and told me I could sleep in and meditate in my room during the non-still settings, but I was unsure if I wanted to continue. I stayed up a good bit of that night just imagining myself losing my mind at the Vipassana. It was scary seeing possible universes where I was violent or crazy. And then my mind flashed back to an uncomfortable memory. Earlier in the day, one of the Dharma workers pulled me aside and talked to me, something they normally wouldn't do in regular situations. He told me he had depression, and he made it through it. I had to keep focus. I looked into his eyes and nodded. Then, like my body was revolting on its own. I felt my chest drop fast and I stumbled backwards and my back thudded against the wall. I slid to the floor hyperventilating. He looked at me confused. I probably looked back at him just as confused. I had no idea what was happening. As I left that room, I just remember seeing a blade on top of one of the buildings, accessible by the stairway. And I just stood there, looking at the blade. I heard the bell ding signifying the start of the meditation. And that snapped me out of it. But it scared me. I got scared. So scared. Staring at the blade, I was afraid of what I've been observing so closely for the last seven days. Myself. By day eight, I had basically made it. I just had to stick it out for one and a half more days. But something deep inside my body told me to stop. It wasn't the part of my body that screams at me if I'm running or studying hard. It felt more like a voice, but like a personal voice, some type of internal guiding voice. It didn't seem like it was even me. It told me I had to leave. It was like some deep part of my consciousness was trying to save me from myself. I thought back to the suffering of my past OCD experiences years back. It felt like day seven, but every day for a year until I got the proper medicine and treatment. I knew I couldn't go back to that state. I don't think I could handle it. This didn't feel like what others were going through. I felt like I had to save myself. I had to go. So that day, I meditated one last time, making sure to focus as hard as possible. I waited until the teacher was ready after breakfast, and I told him I was going crazy. I told him this almost every other day of the course, so he didn't react any differently. 
He smiled and told me to continue. That leaving would delittle the progress. That leaving would be a regret for the rest of my life. That staying would be great for the rest of my life. I told him I was firm in my decision. I needed to go. He asked if I was sure. I said yes. And he seemed a little saddened, and I felt a knot in my chest. I hate letting people down. Or myself down. But I'd given enough time to this. I needed to advocate for myself. He told me to meet him outside. We met and did one more final short meditation. He wished me well. I went past the boundary and signed the papers. When I said the reason for leaving, my eyes were watery. I wrote OCD and then left to the real world. Usually when exiting Vipassana, it's very noisy. For some reason, however, the noise didn't bother me in the least bit. Just the simple ability to talk to another human felt so amazing. Like life was breathing back into me. My dad was happy to see me. He said I stopped texting for a week and was only one day from calling the authorities. We laughed about my timing. Thank God for the interaction. Imagine if the police showed up mid-meditation. I felt the emptiness of my soul starting to deflate. I was going to be okay. Things were okay. I really had nothing to panic about. I could finally be happy again. And in the midst of all the joy, at the end of the call, my dad shared something heartbreaking. I was informed my grandma suddenly stopped responding to people, was hospitalized, had a heartbeat of 30, not able to eat, and had a stroke. Her wishes were that we don't keep her alive if she's just going to be a vegetable. When it's her time, she wants it to be her time. And apparently now was her time. I've never had to deal with death before. Still, as I write this, I'm not quite sure how to process this at all. I was just overseas following this crazy idea, just going for it, fully in the swing of life, and now her funeral is scheduled and I won't be there. I'll be having fun, exploring, and it seems wrong. It seems wrong because my whole world seems to exist in a different reality than hers, than my family's. The hardest part about leaving home is knowing that things will be different, and in this case, permanently different. I won't be able to talk to her when I get back. Time doesn't just stop. It just goes on and on and things deteriorate and opportunities change and people die and that brings tremendous suffering. I didn't know this would happen when I left. I may have acted differently. Am I supposed to carry on with the documentary now without acknowledging something this massive? There's still so much to do and it feels selfish to just keep going like I forgot about her. Like her death doesn't affect me. Her death affects all members of the family and all of them love and miss her dearly. I remember she was one of the most spiritual people I ever knew. In the Philippines, it's expected you get a degree that can make money. A doctor, nurse, lawyer, finance person. Something that makes six figures is the necessity when you're coming to America. But she got a PhD in philosophy. We would always have arguments about philosophy, which inevitably ended up being about religion. She always listened to me with a smile. I think it made her happy I had my own passionate opinions to match hers. She was interested in philosophy and religion, and despite the heavy pressure of her family and society, she kept her focus fixed. She made sure to raise her family Christian, and then her kids raised their family Christian, and so on. That's why I'm confirmed Catholic, because that's what was important to her. I think she would have really liked the idea for this documentary. I think, deep down, she just wanted me to have some type of spiritual basis. So, I'll at least finish this. Still working, but with her in mind, maybe as a way to remember. I felt like I was in the process of recovery, so I didn't want to meditate anymore, but I did a couple tests using my spirit tech devices upon returning. According to the brain reading device, brain patterns had indeed changed after the second retreat, but this time for the worst. It made sense that after the first one, my concentration metrics would shoot up, but by the second, my focus was completely shot, and I only got a calm score of 32%. I guess I could have guessed that without the device. Anyone could have seen I was more anxious now. The brain writing device had a lot more interesting results post-retreat. It's a lot harder to validate how well this device is working, past the manufacturer's own clinical studies, so I would just have to talk about this from my perspective. I got results that weren't quite what I expected from the first time. 
there was this deep anxiety in my chest for the last couple of days as a result from the Vipassana. And strangely, when using that device, it felt lessened. I still felt like I couldn't meditate properly, but I could notice that whatever feeling that was making me nervous seemed to be significantly quieter when using the device. It felt as if it was making it easier, not by taking away the work of focused meditation, but made it easier by decreasing potential roadblocks that could cloud the mind. The first night, I didn't notice too many changes in my sleep. No meditative lucid dreams yet. I think it's a device I must keep up so I can embed this practice deeper in my memories. By day 11, most of the OCD hell had dissolved away, and even though I was heavy with other emotions, I was at least functional. I decided to go back to the Vipassana center to pick up Nada. She'd been texting me as she was afraid she'd drag me into something crazy, something that needed a lot of preparation. Going back to the center was both disheartening and deeply validating. Most of the guys there, who I never talked to, fondly greeted me. They somehow all knew my name. Apparently, they were all talking about me, as it's pretty rare to leave on day eight. Even though none of us talked at the retreat, one guy said that they all really cared about me, and he wanted to know if I was okay. The teacher was there too. He saw how much happier I was, and he smiled back. That felt really nice. I was afraid he would take my leave personally. The Dharma workers, however, were a bit skeptical about my presence. They had tried to keep me there, and I failed, and I think that weighed on them. They told me that I, what I did wasn't wise and that I shouldn't be there, so I took some photos and left. Being in Kathmandu, there's so much to still see. We checked out some expansive malls, as well as Freak Street. During this time, I wanted to get a drone shot, so I flew it up right in the middle of the chaos. The drone battery was low, but I didn't care. I wanted to keep filming some stupa that was a couple hundred meters away. At 5%, to my horror, the connection of the drone from the controller got unexpectedly broken. I wasn't sure why this happened, but in the past the drone would come back home. So I waited. And waited. After 15 minutes, I got really nervous, and then I noticed it was back online. On my phone control app, some of the video of the drone was available. When I opened it up, I saw a photo of my drone falling from 100 meters in the sky. Nod and I rushed over to the last GPS coordinate of the drone. It was sandwiched between a couple of buildings. Catherine Dew is a concrete jungle, full of giant buildings and roads. There's basically nowhere where it wouldn't be hard concrete or asphalt. So the chances that the drone would fall in a place that wasn't rock solid, or maybe somebody's roof, was very low. We ended up in this little 10 meter by 5 meter dumpster. Miraculously, the drone was in the dumpster, with minimal broken parts. All fixable. It fell into soft garbage. This was astounding. I'm not sure if it was good karma, God, or just luck, but I'm very fortunate to still have this drone. This was a mistake I'm sure not to make again, at least in the near future. After that drone incident, we were quite stressed, so we went to see the Dead Body Festival again. It was a really interesting vibe. It had the energy of a large group of people, but it wasn't like a concert. There was a certain happiness and respect in the air. We left, and I tried to interview some dogs and monkeys on the outskirts. None of them were very responsive to my requests. And then it was time to say bye to Nada. I'm in a Garkot now, overlooking Everest as I write and edit this video. Life is good here. The hotel's comfortable. It's just me and my computer. It's kind of lonely, but at least I feel like I have a lot of time to just reflect and order my thoughts. Sitting here, looking out the window, looking at the Himalayas, writing these words, I just feel quite small. I really thought after these meditation camps I would have some deep knowledge of Buddhism, but I think I've just begun my journey. There's a lot of time to just think, just ponder where I am in this project. The goal was to study if there was a way to create spirit tech authentically. Am I any closer to this question? One thing for sure is that I feel like I know so little, and that we all know so little. But I don't think that means we're doomed to lose some design control. We have never fully understood the depths of the technologies we make. We could understand the broad explanations of why something we created works and how to use it. We could understand some of its creative implications. But when you drill down to the fundamental aspects of the technology, there's always blind spots that were complete mysteries to us. Aspects not only critical to our technologies, but our daily lives seem completely unknown. 
Ideas like gravity, time, consciousness, to name a few, were never quite in our complete intellectual grasp. But that didn't stop us from innovating. Building off what we did know and using the properties of the things we didn't fully understand allowed us to create technological miracles. We don't have to fully understand gravity to make rockets that largely escape its pull. We can use what we do understand about a concept to build inventions that coexist. But as our inventions take on greater and more complex problems, our understanding of our own creations start to become fuzzy as well. Take an algorithm that provides content to people. This masterfully engineered machine learning model is created by us, but on a large part, learns on its own. Consumers, nor even the engineers themselves, can explain to you exactly why you got recommended a certain piece of content. For certain really hard problems, we're creating technology that, in itself, is beyond our grasp. This too holds with many of the hardest technological problems surrounding spirit tech. The neuroscientist who created the ultrasound device that deepens meditation doesn't know why it works exactly. The researchers who use the machine learning to form your thoughts into usable data to decrease anxiety don't know how their algorithms got to their conclusion. They just do. Or in the first example, it just works. But what will come from technology that we don't fully understand? providing solutions to us that are beyond what any human could do without the technology. Are we going to increasingly live in a world where complex problems we don't fully understand are solved by complex solutions we don't fully understand? It seems like the trends are going in that direction. We, as modern technological humans, understand far more scientific reality than our ancestors did. We already live in a reality where our content diet what we are exposed to electronically is dictated by that which is beyond us. We may soon live in a reality where our spiritual experiences are handed over to algorithms and tools so that which alters ourselves isn't fully known. Our gift of intelligence will breed more intelligence that will create more complex webs we can't unravel. My wish is that we make sure not to forget to take care of ourselves with spirit tech, even if the problem solvers of the future are coming up with solutions whose depths are beyond our capacity. Despite being alone here, having a device to dynamically keep me focused is really helping me not lose my mind. I think I'm going to use these technologies forever now in my meditative practices. It's helpful. That's all it is. And at this point, that's all I want it to be. I'm trying to stay happy, but for some reason, reality here in the Himalayas feels so grim. So alone, so rainy. I'm not quite sure how my OCD hasn't consumed me completely. Last night, I used the lucid dream machine and found an escape from this constrained area. In this dream, I was with loved ones. We were hanging out, but what we were doing specifically, I couldn't remember. I think it was dark and dreary, like the sky was a personification of depression. But I remember I was happy. I feel like I could have been lucid, but controlling the dream wouldn't be necessary. In this dream, I was already beyond happy with the people I loved. Where I was and what I was doing wasn't even evident. I just remember me being there with them. And I woke up happy. Some of those anxieties that I felt during the day were just gone. I knew most of those people would still be there when I get back. And I knew I'd be back eventually. So can we make authentic spirit tech? I think the answer is a resounding yes, as these devices have already accomplished it if only on a very surface level. But as the technology progresses to new sci-fi frontiers, I still retain hope that we'll figure it out as a species. These technologies are here to stay, and the work we do now is critical. We may not fully understand our creations, but as long as we go in with the right ethics, planting the seed, making strong values, we can remain at least on the right trajectory. If you have ethics, very strong ethics within yourself, and very strong values of what's important for you and what makes you you, then whatever relationship you have with whatever is going to be based on that, including technology. Technology that we have now is breathtaking, and one of my biggest fears is that our wisdom can't keep up with the progress. But I feel like that's a limited perspective. We have been accumulating wisdom in all kinds of different cultures for as long as humans have been a species, and most of this wisdom seems very similar to each other. Many of these commandments and suggestions set out by religions are some derivation of the golden rule. It's as if the wisdom is already there, 
the road already made clear by so many thinkers at so many different times at human history. We just need to cultivate a society that's exposed to this wisdom. Maybe a more relevant fear is that we'll be too tied up in the systems that we created that we forget these ethical roots that we've been taught. Is a capitalistic system that rewards companies based on addictiveness and sometimes exploitation the wrong one for building the spirit tech future we desire? So the folks who are interested in, um, in creating these technologies are sort of beholden to these systems to a certain extent. And yet they're mm. also actively trying to uh, almost thwart what the system would want them to do. I really think that humans are very smart and that we have this amazing capacity to, you know, um, to destroy ourselves or, or to, you know, or to elevate ourselves, you know. If we have these ethics and design in such a way that's practical in the systems we have, but also mindful of the consumers using it, I think we should expect significant change and be okay with it. I believe it's going to be, it's the future of the church is the metaverse. Oh. Um, I don't think it's time to lose hope. These technologies are only corrupted by our ignorance, and humans are wiser than we give them credit for. I miss home. I miss biking and running in sunny Colorado. Miss my friends, miss my family. I'm trying so hard to close this documentary with this final journal reflection in a way that's true to the original spirit tech idea. But I feel like that idea became so secondary. I went on an adventure to understand spiritual technology, and although transformative, this wasn't mainly what the documentary was about. It was about my adventure, my life, that's what was interesting, the human experience. Through the ups and downs, technology was just a backdrop, and at a certain point in editing this, I was happy with this new focus. Yes, spirit tech will get better, and yes, this will affect many people's lives. But I think the main focus should always be on the human experience. I think that's what it's about in the end. It only took one major life event to sober me to this reality, and I think it's a good reality to face. I'll keep in mind technology as a tool to achieve what may not be possible alone, but the goal will forever be beyond that. The spiritual side of spirit tech should always be the driving factor. Today, I called up my mom. I knew my grandma was in bad condition as I already set the funeral date, but it's finally over now. She passed away peacefully this morning. Just before writing this, I called my family. Almost everyone had tears in their eyes. I remember right before the trip, I went to Chicago to drop off my sister. I saw grandma there. She was much frailer than I remembered her before. She still remembered me. She had pictures of Jesus on the wall around the room. She ate her food slowly and chewed carefully. As I was leaving with my sister, I ran back to the room to say goodbye to her one more time. I knew any day it could be her last. So I told her I loved her and lightly hugged her on the shoulder. I looked at her one last time and sprinted out, catching up to my dad and sister. And I guess that's the last time I'll ever see her. I'm fortunate that I even had a goodbye. Sitting in a nice cafe overlooking the Himalayas. That's where I've been doing most of my writing and editing for the last couple of days. There's this cat that comes to me every so often. The owner said it only started coming since I came. And strangely for the cat, it doesn't eat the food people give it. It just comes by, sits next to the table I work, and looks up at me, occasionally making some purring noises. After the news of my grandma, the cat came up to me in the cafe and lovingly sat in the same spot it always does. This time it resided longer. Something about it being with me made me feel not as alone, not as sad. Something about that cat reminded me of my grandma, like she found me up here, 7,500 miles away and 6,000 feet up, like she was still here with me. I stared at that cat a long time, my eyes teary. This was an emotion I hadn't felt for a long time. I wanted the cat to just leave, to just be a cat, to just act like a cat, but it just stayed there, lovingly and patiently, waiting for me to go. So, after a couple hours, I said goodbye and left. Straightened my spine, focused on my breath, and took a hard gulp. I slowly walked out of the cafe. 
been a couple days and I've been feeling a little more optimistic. After this experience, I'll be going to Thailand and see my friends as I study abroad. These are childhood friends who I truly love. I know we'll have a lot of great adventures in the future. I'll then go home and see those friends, my girlfriend, family, and then finish my degree, and then hopefully do a master's in something related to spirit tech, and then, well, I don't know. But the point is I have hope in the future. There are things to look forward to. Good changes to come as well. I think I'll look at this journey fondly in the future. Yes, it was arduous, but I think a lot came from it. I really believe putting my energy in this field is the most valuable and important thing I can do to personally contribute to society. It's been an interesting journey so far, and I'm still excited to see where it takes me in the future. Until then, I'll try my best to stay present, stay spiritual, keep learning tools to make my dreams a reality, and have as much meaningful human connection as possible in this process. There's so many reasons to stay hopeful for this technological future. Optimism is the best way forward.